Paul Seven, and uh, I, I'm delighted to uh, uh, introduce our talk for the evening. So Walter Scott's writing has received a lot more attention recently, as I think everyone here believes is very well deserved. Rather less well known is Sir Walter's enjoyment of nature and his management of the natural world around him. He studied the planting of trees and became something of an authority on the subject indeed. Buying land and planting trees became an addiction mm -hmm. and uh, was one of the factors which left him with no money when the publishing business of Archibald Constable and James Ballantyne crashed into bankruptcy and carried Scott down with them. Uh, to tell us a great deal more about this important part of Walter Scott's life, we're very fortunate tonight to have with us Dr. Susan Oliver, reader in literature at the University of Essex, where she writes about and teaches romantic, transatlantic and periodical studies along with eco-criticism. Susan's published many articles about Sir Walter Scott and Scottish literature and about the literature of the romantic period more generally. She was awarded the British Academy's Rose Mary Crawshay Prize in 2007 for her book Scott Byron and the Poetics of Cultural Encounter, but of closest importance to us is that she's writing a monograph entitled Green Scott that mm. reevaluates Sir Walter Scott's writing about the ecological history of Scotland, and that book also assesses Scott's forward importance to the 20th and 21st century environmental studies. So, ladies and gentlemen, okay. I am ready, and I hope you are, to receive Dr. Susan Oliver. Susan. Thank you, Alistair, and um, thank you also for making the arrangements, kindly making the arrangements for me to come up here this evening. I'd like to thank Lee as well, because he's been involved in, in those arrangements. Thank you, everybody, for coming along to hear my talk this evening. It's a great honour to speak to the Wallace Scott Club, which I haven't spoken to um, previously, although many of my friends and um, people that I know in the world of Scott scholarship certainly have. Um, Alastair mentioned that I work on some. I, I work on an area of critical studies at the moment that's known as eco-criticism, and I'm, I'm thinking that some people will probably know what that is, is and some people probably won't. The thing about eco-criticism is it's concerned with looking looking at literature with with fresh eyes to see how it values the land um, in its own right, uh, and on the other hand looking at how writers position themselves, not in a position of superiority necessarily to the land, but as an equal with it. And I think um, Sir Walter very much did that. He was very interested in the stories that the land could tell him, as well as what we could gain um, from the land in other ways. And my talk this evening will, will, draw, will indeed draw upon the book that I'm writing, Green Scott, um, which is subtitled Historical Fiction, Ballads and National Ecologies. That book is very kindly supported by, by the British Academy and the Lever Hume Trust, who've given me a grant to come and do work in Scotland um, in order to, to take my writing further. The talk I'm going to give to you this evening is um, a piece from the research for that book, and in a longer form than uh, the talk I have here, it will be published as an essay in the Yearbook of English Studies next year, which is dedicated to Sir Walter Scott, and which I shall be editing, and many of your other speakers uh, have essays that will be in that, that collection. Well, uh, I won't continue talking about the book there, because I'd like to get on with the, um, with, with the talk for you this morning. Scott claimed to have planted more than a million trees, with the aid of workers on his estate, he probably did. He also wrote passionately, and as it transpired prophetically, against a future in which industrial forestry would lead to sweeping monocultures of non-native species replacing Scotland's old growth woodlands. His two essays on forestry practice and landscape for the Quarterly Review, published late in his life in October 1827 and 1828, critically examined economic definitions of the term wasteland, influencing practice and policies in arboriculture across Britain. 
Washington Irving recalled in the Crayon Miscellany, published serially in, the Bos in Boston in the Monthly Traveller in 1835 and mentioned in Lockett's Memoirs of the Life of Sir Walter Scott, that when the two men were walking in Edinburgh during Irving's visit to Abbotsford in 1817, Scott spoke of seeing a huge imported white pine trunk on the dockside. In Irving's recollection, Scott talked about the tree's life and ecological role in the forests of North America. A catalyst for Scott's imagination was the transatlantic lumber trade in which emigrant Scots from the Highland clearances, in effect, were already being exchanged for return cargoes of timber. Aye, and that's the great charm of your country. You love the forest as I do the heather, but I would not have you think I do not feel the glory of a great woodland prospect. There is nothing I should like more than to be in the midst of one of your grand, wild, original forests with the idea of hundreds of miles of untrodden forest around me. I once saw at Leith an immense stick of timber just landed from America. It must have been an enormous tree when it stood on its native soil, at its full height and with all its branches. These vast Aboriginal trees, which have sheltered the Indians before the intrusion of the white men, are, monu are the monuments and antiquities of your country. By the second decade of the 19th century, commercial deforestation in North America was already radically interfering with the complex ecologies that had evolved over millennia. Harvesting of the eastern white pine in particular, and more general logging clear cuts were initiating climate change, as had been forecast by Thomas Jefferson in his notes on the state of Virginia. Jefferson imagined that change to be beneficial to society on the basis of microclimates that were more conducive to human habitation and farming. Meanwhile, everyday people in Scott's novels comment on the decline in salmon stocks in Scotland's rivers due to overnetting of returning fish in estuaries and the damming of rivers. Over a meal of mutton broth, bannocks, oat cakes, butter and a kebbock, a mixed sheep's and goat cow's milk cheese in this instance, the narrator of Old Mortality remembers a period when salmon was caught in such plenty in the considerable rivers in Scotland that instead of being considered a delicacy, accounted a delicacy, sorry, it was generally applied to feed the servants. In The Antiquary, Scott comments on the space allotted for the passage of a salmon through a dam, dyke or weir by statute, being the length within which a full-grown pig can turn himself around. Scott's comments in these novels almost certainly related to concerns from his own day, but the statute that he mentions here, as David Hewitt points out in his Edinburgh edition of The Antiquary, actually dates from the reign of William the Lion, who ruled from 1165 to 1214, so it's a very old statute. Even in Magna Carta, in 1215, provided for the dismantling of the English king's weirs to allow salmon to travel upriver for the public good. And successive statutes in England and Scotland attempted to ensure that the stocks were maintained. However, by the early 19th century, Scottish river salmon stocks had diminished drastically. David Montgomery's excellent 2003 book, King of Fish, The Thousand Year Run of Salmon, and I'd recommend that to anybody who's interested in salmon stocks in rivers in Scotland, makes the point that by 1817, just a year after the publication of The Antiquary and Old Mortality, £750,000 of chilled Scottish salmon per year was being exported to London. Fish were unable to reach their spawning grounds, Legislation to allow river passage to migrating salmon and trout remains highly controversial in our own age of fish ladders. More than 35% of the world's fresh water is now constrained behind dams. I'm going to return to um, that matter at the end of, of this topic. Also in the antiquary and on the Aberdeenshire coast, fictional fisherwomen haggle over the pricing of commonplace and rarer species. Haddock, whiting, Lumpsucker, Turbot, John Dory. People lose their livelihoods, some lose their lives. Meanwhile, in Old Mortality, 
Fruit trees and pasture for livestock are watered by streams that flow through sites of massacre, transferring minerals and organic compounds such as blood and bone meal down with them and into the food chain. With a providence unknown in other parts of Scotland, the peasants have in most places planted orchards around their cottages and the general blossom of the apple trees at this season of the year gave all the lower part of the view the appearance of a flower garden. Looking upriver, the character of the scene was varied considerably for the worse. A hilly waste and uncultivated country approached close to the banks. The trees were few and limited to the neighbourhood of the stream, and the rude moors swelled at a little distance into shapeless and heavy hills. Thus the tower commanded two prospects, the one richly cultivated and highly adorned, and the other exhibiting the monotonous, and sorry, that should be dreary character of wild and inhospitable moorland. Scott's frame narrative in this tale of my landlord has by this point already noted that Covenanters died in those same hills. During this long pilgrimage, the pious enthusiast regulated his circuit so as annually to visit the graves of the unfortunate Covenanters who suffered by the sword or by the executioner. These were most numerous in the western districts of Ayr, Galloway and Dumfries, but they are also to be found in other parts of Scotland, where the fugitives had fought or fallen or suffered by military or civil execution. Their tombs are often apart from all human habitation in the remote moors and wilds to which the wanderers had fled for concealment. Stones accumulate deer hair, lichens and particles of soil that permeate their surface to reveal a still unfolding history beyond the human lives memorialised in their inscriptions. The mythic unchanging solidity of stone is brought into question by that process of transformation. Let's look back to the beginning of Scott's career and his collected ballads in Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border. In The Flowers of the Forest, the first part of which is original and the second a composition by Scott himself, please forgive me if I'm saying things that people already know, but I'm thinking some people won't know these things and others will. Um, the first part which was original and the second a composition by Scott himself, wildflowers symbolically cling to existence at the edge of paths and of memory the metaphor recalling the loss of young men's lives at the Battle of Flodden Field. Scott laments throughout the minstrelsy and elsewhere that the great Caledonian and Borders forests had all but gone like the young men who once lived on the land. Meanwhile, at nearby Huntley Bank and the site of the legendary Eildon tree, probably a blackthorn or hawthorn, still commonplace now throughout Scotland, Story has it that the 13th and early 14th century Scottish poet Thomas of Erceldoun, known as the Rhymer, was taken on a subterranean journey of self-discovery amongst the roots of the tree by an elf queen dressed all in moss green. Now I'll say more about that journey, uh, the Eildon tree and the Rhymer's Glen shortly, but I want for now just to establish the role of trees and forests in the stories that Scott unearthed from the area that he knew best. These stories, sometimes reclaimed, often embellished, and frequently invented, were told by Scott in ways that rooted literature in the soil of the nation and nourished it with the water of rivers. In terms of their deep ecological content, the, min the minstrelsy ballads look back from Scott's lifetime across 500 years of human history in the borders and even further. Moving forward to 1889 and across the Atlantic to North America, Robert Louis Stevenson revisited Scott's Master of Ravenswood, who in the Bride of Lammermoor had died in quicksand along the Lothian coast, reinventing him as a much darker master as he transplanted the cultural legacy of Scottish Romanticism into the frozen winter soil of upstate New York. In The Master of Ballantrae, an inscribed stone commemorates the burial place of Stevenson's émigré, James Dury, whose death results from a catastrophic failure of environmental and cultural understanding. And I've said elsewhere, I've referred to the fact that James Dury dies wrapped in a full buffalo robe, that is the full skin of a buffalo. And at the point that 
Stevenson was publishing The Master of Ballantrae. The buffalo was all but wiped out in North America in its own right. So he dresses himself in the skin of an animal that itself is facing extinction by that point. And they're buried in the soil. The rest of my talk is concerned with specific examples that demonstrate some key moments when Walter Scott's environmental imagination worked in his writing to give a voice to the land itself. I'll consider the role played by trees and rivers in that process. Some of the writing is personal and was not intended for an immediate public readership, while other examples are from his poetry and fiction. In Scott's own lifetime, the land was, after all, being altered and changed in ways that made reading it increasingly difficult. In one instance, Scott identifies the eye of the novelist, the familiar eye of the novelist, as the only means of retrieving a history of violent persecution. I'll begin with a return to the ballads and move on through poetry to the historical novels. So the land writes back, Scott ballads, trees, and grounding the imagination. While writing alongside his work as a lawyer and journalist, Scott nurtured his passion for growing trees. His journals from Abbotsford, purchased in 1811, nine years after the first publication of the minstrelsy, record species, trees, but also herbaceous flora. They record the locations where they were planted and their success or failure. Scott's letters show his concern that when he bought Abbotsford, it was almost bare of trees, consistent with the effects of recent high demands of tip for timber for shipbuilding from such estates. His tree planting journal, Silver Abbotsfordiensis, in which he made entries between 1819 and 1825, shows his attention to soil types, to aspect and local climate, sandy, wet, exposed or sheltered, looking all the time for optimum conditions for growing native and imported species. And I'd like here to acknowledge Alison Lumsden and Gerard Carruthers' excellent online edition of The Silver for the Faculty of Advocates Library website, and that edition is freely available to anybody who wants to look that up. Areas of his estate were also given names linking them to characters in the minstrelsy ballads and in local folklore. The Rhymer's Glen, named after Thomas the Rhymer or Thomas of Erseldoon, the title character from one of the ballads that I've already mentioned, is a case in point. Many, probably most of you, will know the uh, location of the Rhymer's Glen is somewhere in the vicinity of the Eildon Hills and that the original location remains contentious. In the silver, however, Rhymer's Glen refers to a specific area of Scots estate not now far from the Rhymer's Stone. I want to just look at some slides that I've got here off the Rhymer's Glen as it is now. This would have been a night. This would have been a nightmare for Scott because this is a plantation of Sitka spruce, and that's one of the trees that he dreaded being planted in Scotland. Anyway, this is and this is the brook that runs through the Rhymer's Glen, and some way that probably inspired Scott in his writing about Gilpin Horner in the Lay of the Last Minstrel, the tree canopy looking very daunting and very um, mysterious. I'll come back to that one in a moment. In the silver, the Rhymer's Glen, the silver Abbot's Gordiensis, his planting journal, the Rhymer's Glen is actually a strangely oblique and enigmatic presence because it's described mainly in terms of the surrounding land. This is a photograph that I took um, last September at the Borders Walking Festival. We went through the Rhymer's Glen and it seemed uh, very consistent with Scott's writing about um, fairies and folklore in the landscape that that Sitka spruce plantation was surrounded by cobwebs and bushes, um, beautifully atmospheric. And of course, um, Cole Shields Lock and somebody very kindly told me the legend of the water bull that lives in there and um, happy to talk with anybody about that afterwards. No time for it in here. Anyway, um, perhaps configuring the Rhymer's Glen as mysterious suited Scott's desire to preserve a sense of mystery. Near to the glen's entrance in the silver, oaks and larches are the dominant tree species, growing in what Scott describes as an indifferent soil that slopes to the east, with the planted larches showing damage due to, and I quote Scott here, the activity of hares. The larches are not thriving. The soil is indifferent. To the east and southeast, an area planted with ash and larch is choked by coarse grass and the trees are bent, while just a few sweet or Spanish chestnuts are beginning to thrive. 
north and west running to the bottom of the glen, more up larches are affected by strangulation by coarse grass. In each of these instances that I've just mentioned, tree species, planted ash, but also non-native larches and Spanish chestnuts, have had their growth curtailed by the quiet violence and silent resistance of local land and its ecologies. Hares, tangled and coarse grass. It's as if the land is protesting against invasion. But how does the soil on Scott's estate connect with the minstrelsy ballads themselves? Well, let's look at an example. As we know, Thomas the Rhymer is partly an old anonymous traditional ballad and partly an improved fragment followed by a modern imitation extension by Scott. In that respect, it is a poem that has evolved and grown through time. Set in a particular, if legendary, place in the borders, Huntley Bank, near the Eildon Hills and the village of Erseldoon and under a particular tree, the ballad nurtures and keeps alive a close affinity with place. Included in the first and all subsequent editions of the minstrelsy, Thomas the Rhymer roots the origins of Scottish literature in the material substance of the soil of a local community, and that community includes the trees, of course. In the ground of the borders more generally, and in the land of Scotland as a nation. But the soil begins at a strange and alien place, primeval, prior, and outside of those recognisable socio-political structures, Thomas must discover it, and he must come to know it, before he can be a truly inspirational poet. It is symbolic, as well as substance. OK, so the first part of the ballad is a composite of two copies. Let's just think about the significance of the origins of those copies. One of them came to Scott via Mrs Brown of Aberdeen. The other copy is recorded only as being, and I'll quote here, obtained from a lady residing not far from Ursel Doon. While the first copy indicates the mobility of ballads arising out of particular soils, um, travelled to Aberdeen, the second copy remains rooted exactly where the ballad was originally set, and its source for Scott, tantalisingly, is a lady residing not far away. Does that allude in a tantalising manner to the character from the ballad itself, the lady or elf queen who Thomas encounters, not very far from Ursel Doon? I'm left wondering. It's that first composite part of the ballad that I'm most interested in for the first part of this talk. The poem begins with the story of how Thomas regarded Scotland's first, regarded as Scotland's first poet, came to know the soil through an encounter linked to a tree. The process is one of immersion. Before that experience, we know only that Thomas composed verses. Then, while sitting on Huntley Bank, underneath the Eildon tree, he spies for his E a fairy, or the strange lady riding a horse, a supernatural creature of the soil, and I argue, representing its compelling and ancient strangeness, she carries him down into the earth, among the roots of the tree, among the roots of the tree, beguiling him she sings, Thomas, ye mourn ride with me. All the time, this phantasmagoric soil woman compels the poet to sing his rhymes. Harp and carp, Thomas, she said. Harp and carp, a lang with me. All underneath the Eildon tree. The rhymer lives with the elf, elf queen underground among the roots of the tree for seven years before returning to the surface. And when he returns to the world of 13th century Scotland, his poetry has been transformed by the experience. An environmental vision, version of the literary trope of the vision of the, the visit to the underworld, if you like. He has changed and his words now take the form of prophecy meaning wisdom as much as the ability to see the future, which he also has. Thomas the Rhymer is at the centre of the green structure of the minstrelsy. The poem tells the history of a land on which literature depends, putting that land and what grows from it first. Dirt and soil are often thought of as less than glamorous substances. The Rhymer's encounter with the fairly, however, recognises the earth precisely as a glamorous and entrancing matter, something that not only cannot be ignored, but that absolutely will not be resisted and will not be forgotten. The success of the ballad, evident through its, 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 its currency down the ages, relies on the agency of the earth as matter and symbol. Now, 
Thomas was just another poet before his transformational encounter. Taking his own pseudonyms, the title Rhymer, Wizard and Minstrel, Scott's own writing owes the essence of its vitality, I argue, to his profound love for and knowledge of the Scottish borders. The Eildon tree, with its roots in the soil and its branches above the poet, connects the human world and the material earth and the sky. Beneath it, and by knowing what normally remain because all too easily be remains unseen, the poet becomes part of something much bigger. By the time Scott published The Minstrelsy in 1802, he knew that not just the appearance, but the substance of the soil of the borders had been changed. An anciently wooden wooded landscape had been transformed into one dominated and defined by pasture. Sheep grazing changes the soil. The animal's grazing habits and the mat-like roots of grass affect the water and the consistency of the earth, which in turn defines everything that not only lives below the surface of the ground, but that might be buried there. Scott's later 1810 poem, the Lady of the in Scott's later 1810 poem, The Lady of the Lake, the story of which concerns a 16th century situation on the geological fault line between the borders and the highlands. There is an anachronistic reference to that very matter of land use change. The character Roderick Dhu warns fugitives from the borders. From yarrow brays and banks of tweed, where lone streams of ettrick glide, and from the Teviot's side, the dales where martial clans did ride are now one sheep walk waste and wide. Those lines identify four borders rivers that meant a great deal to Scott, the Yarrow, Ettrick, Teviot and Tweed. Indeed, the first three flow into the Tweed. Despite significant changes in land use, the sheep walk waste and wide, and to a lesser extent artificial alterations that were made to their own courses, the rivers together suggest features of permanency over those of mutability and change. If we read Roderick Dew's words as intertextual dialogue, they create a reflective link back to Scott's first poem from five years earlier in 1805, The Lay of the Last Minstrel. In doing so, they hint at Wordsworth's well-known opening to lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey, when the poet recalls hedgerows close to the River Wye, precisely from five years earlier. The story of the lay involves a frame narrative of an aged minstrel who is lost in a bleak landscape. He wanders alone, a creative hybrid combination of a character from medieval romance, and Scott was deeply influenced by the Italian romance poets Pulci, Ariosto, Boiardo, and Tasso. Um, early modern borders oral folklore and a more latterly romantic Wordsworthian solitary. He is, in effect, strangely out of time and place. He has no one to sing to, and there's no one to hear him. His harp is out of tune and he has been relegated to the status of a sturdy beggar or a vagabond. But then he comes to a castle where he is taken in and regains his ability to sing and play using all of the tropes of chivalric love and martial action. He brings alive, after a banquet, an historic tale of knights and ladies, goblin pages, enchanted woods and magic books. I've written about that poem elsewhere, so I'll get to my point where this talk is concerned. The minstrel is rejuvenated and able to sing again only when he passes where Newark's stately tower looks out from the Yarrow's birch and bower. The river, which, is in, which in the poem is set in birch woods, not only fe features here, but at 11 other points in the same poem. And it becomes the place where the minstrel finally makes his new home that will enable him to continue singing. The second quotation is from the end of the poem, the top one from the beginning of the poem. Again, Scott directly connects storytelling and the land, in this instance, through the sound of flowing water. When throstles sung in Harehead Shore, and corn was green on Carter Howe, and flourished black, broad black andros oak, the aged harper's soul awoke. Then he would sing achievements high and circumstance of chivalry till the rapt traveller would stay forgetful of the closing day. I think Scott had a propensity to do that with people who were staying with him. Um, <laughs> forgetful of the closing day. And noble youths are strained to hear, forsook the, hunt, the hunting of the deer. And Yarrow, as he rolled along, bore burden to the minstrel's song. Scott was writing about rivers that inspired his own imagination. 
His houses at Ashesteel and Abbotsford were both close to the banks of the Tweed, and it's a well-known anecdote that when he was close to death, he asked to be taken back to Abbotsford to hear the sound of the Tweed once more from his bedroom. If you listen in Abbotsford, the river is indeed audible. I have a theory based on plans and on observations of the river in line with, as it is in line with Scott's bedroom that at some point during the years that he owned the estate he may have enhanced the sound with strategically placed stone in water and that the growing trees he planted would have helped further amplify the volume of the sound of the river. The combined sound of stone and water would further add weight to the argument that he understood how the land itself spoke to his imagination. Now, I mentioned earlier salmon and Scott's concern about salmon stocks. As the Scottish Borders Council says, not only is the Tweed now world famous for its salmon fishing, I think we all know that, it was the first river to be managed for the benefit of both the environment and the fish. Walter Scott and a group of his friends established the Tweed Commissioners, who were responsible for that management, in 1805, and that's the same year that he publishes The Lay of the Last Minstrel, of course. But that's another story. I'll conclude by returning to Scott's novels, historical novels, and some of what I say here has been published in a slightly different form from this, so I apologise to anybody who may have um, read it. In Waverley, a landscape of absence deriving from the removal of trees at Tully Veolan is one of the last vivid images. Not only had the felled trees been removed, but their stumps being grubbed up and the earth round them levelled and sown with glass, it was evident that the marks of devastation, unless to an eye intimately acquainted with the spot, and that's Scott of course, were already obliterated. Potential reminders of a past that is dangerously disturbing, in this case the Battle of Culloden. The damaged trees have not been felled. Every trace of their existence has not merely been felled, Every trace of their existence has been removed from the soil, which has then had its contours levelled. Scott's use of the phrase grubbed up, closely followed by obliterated, denotes a violent process of clearance of the trees and of the historical record afforded by the soil they grew in. That late use of violence is just one act in a catalogue of brutalism in Waverley, perpetrated on the natural and the human world using implements of war. In an earlier chapter, titled Desolation, the same trees, identified as ancient, were, quote, mined with a quantity of gunpowder placed in the cavity. One had been shivered to pieces by the explosion and the wreck lay scattered around. The other one survives, but as you can I won't read the longer quote on here, but it's mutilated and, def and um, defaced on one side and part of it is torn away from its mass. Um, the trees are first destroyed and later removed, not because they fail to conform to the principles of picturesque beauty in their condition of ruin. Indeed, they will be prime examples of that. They're removed because their as ru presence as ruins might constitute a monument to the damage done to the nation by internecine warfare. Some battles have memorials, but not in this instance, the 45. We might ask if reading the land is what produces stories, then what happens when the place and even the soil has been rendered unreadable? Well, Scott as the author of Waverley here establishes himself as what his narrator calls the eye intimately acquainted with the spot. His fiction serves as elegy, testimony and memorial. The ballad singer Davy Galatly skips awkwardly along a path by a lawn <coughs> in the now treeless grounds, dressed in a new suit of clothes. For all his joy in his refined appearance, something has happened. The trees have gone, and so has Davy's memory. He cannot remember the words or music of any of the old songs he once knew. The popular oral history that he represents has been lost, just as people have gone and trees have been removed. Scott leaves Waverley's readers with a grassy landscape of absence and loss, deprived of contour and var variation, that renders sinister the strangely euphoric happiness of the remaining characters at Edward's and Rose Bradwardine's wedding. Scott, by the way, added a note that he actually knew of two trees that did have this done to them at that, that particular point. Some of you may know that. 
Looking at the scene from a contemporary critical perspective the, perspective, the fabric of the nation extending beyond just the visible surface has suffered a catastrophic change in its structure. The matted roots of the grass are different from the deep tap and lateral roots of the trees and the entire makeup of the soil has been altered. An analogy is made with rural Scotland, in particular the borders and the highlands, in which people and trees have been replaced by sheep pasture. Both testify to the changing land use that was leading to emigration and to the exchange of Scottish people for Canadian trees on vessels that changed their two cargoes at either end of the transatlantic journey. The tales have not been lost because Scott, as the latter-day rhymer and minstrel, has transferred the story from the landscape to the page. To conclude, in old mortality, the natural environment assumes a different agency. Far from effacing its history in its lonely and latterly uninhabited space, the teeming environment of moss, lichen and deer hair encrusted headstones ensures that memory does remain alive. Toward the end of the novel, the protagonist Morton undertakes a journey that reads symbolically as a ride through the history of the nation. He advanced up the narrow dell, which had once been a wood, but was now a ravine divested of trees, unless where a few, from their inaccessible situation on the edge of precipitous banks or clinging among rocks and huge stones, defied the invasion of men and cattle. These two, wasted and decayed, seem to exist rather than to flourish and the only and they only serve to indicate what the landscape had once been but the stream brawled down among them in all its freshness and vivacity giving life and animation which a mountain rivulet alone can confer on the barest and most savage scenes and which the inhabitants of such a country miss when gazing even upon the tranquil winding of a majestic stream through plains of fertility and beside palaces of pleasure. The track of the road followed the course of the brook, which was now visible, distinguished by its brawling, heard among the stones or in the clefts of the rock that occasionally interrupted the course. We have the sound of the river again. Morton passes through an environment altered for the worse by human invasion. Its ravines are divested of trees, and the few that are left are wasted and decayed. Eventually, he emerges in a new landscape, freshly bursting with vitality imparted by a mountain rivulet that produces sounds by its in interaction with rocks and stones. By contrast, the, the, the sluggish stream meandering in lazy tranquility um, is a mere distraction, a charm if you like, probably an imagined or even enchanted landscape, but one that fails to silence the earthy songs and vigorous culture to which the land with its fresher free-flowing rivulets bears witness and which tells the stories that were there to be reclaimed and read through the literary agency of Sir Walter Scott's page. I've long thought that Scott's novels are really ballads, and that they have passed through the narrative genre of poetry to become the genre of narrative poetry to become further updated for an early 19th century readership much more attuned to prose fiction read in the privacy of the home. It seems to me that his prose fiction remains deeply rooted in the landscape in which trees and rivers are markers of memory for storytelling in ways that recall the tropes and devices of literature's ancient oral past. Scott modelled himself on the minstrel tradition at the same time that he not only embraced the modern, modern genre of the novel, but took it forwards. One of the most famous anecdotes of Scott is that told by James Hogg of his mother admonishing the author of the minstrelsy for killing the ballads by printing them. It is an old story. Ye have broken, I can't do the accent, sorry, many of you <laughs> certainly could. Ye have broken the charm now, and they'll never be sung mere. Um, Mr. Ladlaw replies, take that, Mr. Scott, and, um, sorry, I should have put that up for you. It's an old story. They were, made, they were made for singing and no for reading, but ye have broken the charm now, and they'll ne'er be sung there. Take ye that, Mr. Scott, said Ladlaw. Scott answered with a hearty laugh. I'll leave you with the verdict, my verdict, that Margaret Ladlaw was wrong 
Scott's ongoing body of writing and all of the many works that it influenced, I mentioned Robert Louis Stevenson at the beginning of my talk as just one obvious example, was the ongoing song. Moreover, that song remained rooted like a tree in the soil and it goes on being heard today, just as the sound of the yarrow bore burden to the voice of the last minstrel. I was very interested to hear about the schools project. One of my own students who, um, Red Scott with me as an undergraduate at Essex and has recently started teaching in, in a high school in Essex, way down south, wrote to me uh, two or three weeks ago to say that he'd been teaching Walter Scott to his class. I'm delighted to hear that. So the sound of the, 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 the song goes on being heard. Thank you for listening to my talk this evening. I'm very indebted to you all for inviting me here to, the, to share this, this work that I've been doing. It's been an honour and a real privilege speaking to so many people who I know have long-standing interests in Scott and his work and probably know much more about him than I do. I'm sure I could learn a lot from just talking to, 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 to you about, about these matters. Over the summer break from university teaching and with the help of my British Academy and Leverhulme Trust grant, I shall be moving ahead with my writing of the Green Scott book. In the meantime, I'll be pleased to try to answer any questions you may have about anything that I've said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Susan. I think that's given us uh, a marvellous insight into how not only the countryside was under Scott's skin as well as the soil under his fingernails, so uh, I'm sure that the must, the, what you've said must have raised many questions in people's minds. So uh, a student said she'd be delighted to uh, answer any questions, engage in any discussion. So who would like to kick off? Martin. Um, thanks. That was, that was very interesting. Great, actually. Um, I have a couple of other questions, but they're so anarchy, I'll leave them until later, maybe, if that's okay. Okay, um, yes. But, uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask just quickly. Well, Can you speak up, Martin? I wanted to ask the uh, just, yeah, just yeah. quickly, or perhaps oh, no. not quickly, um, because I was interested in what you were saying about the, the landscape uh, at the end of Waverley when he talks yes. about restoration. Yes. Of course, that connects with the kind of post colonial eco criticism stuff about landscape and power. Yes. And of course, Flora manipulates the landscape as well when yes. she presents herself Absolutely, in this yeah. garden. I wonder, can you say a bit about more about sovereignty and power and that sort of thing within the landscape, within Scott's view of the landscape or... Yeah, I mean, the thing, I, I think the thing is with um, Waverley, traditionally Waverley has been read um, as a novel that resolves everything through the marriage of um, Edward Waverley and Rose Bradbodine, but I think anybody who really knows Scott well has always felt that that's a strange union, there's something uneasy about it. And we see that elsewhere in Scott's um, novels, in Ivanhoe, for example, that would be a classic ex example. So um, the, the, the marriage itself is a marriage that should ensure the future, um, should we say, harmony of um, the nation. But I think the fact that the landscape itself has been so altered, um, it isn't just that union that brings together what is there and brings it up to date for modern times. It's something that has to deal with all of those things that have changed, all of those things that have been lost. Now I'd say with, um, Ro with uh, Flora, she certainly does manipulate the landscape in the terms of romanticism, the picturesque, um, the Highland tradition. When I started working on Scott, I was stunned when I looked at a copy of um, Thomas Pennant's travels and saw an illustration of a figure standing on a log over a ravine waving. I, I, well, now I know where Scott got the idea from. So um, I think that, I mean, we, if we read Scott's work as a whole and we go a lot further forward to his um, Tales of a Grandfather, he actually, when he writes, you know, that like, uh, he talks about what happened to the Highlands is like looking back on a prospect in an evening when things take on a glow that was not properly their own. And he talks on the one hand about that romantic version of the Highland, which in the novel is constructed very much by Flora, and the reality of things, which was the turning of the land over to sheep grazing. He's in some ways explaining what happens at the end of Waverley there. I mean, what happens is the sovereignty of the land does pass into the hand of, hands of people who will 
um, turn it over or, or who have already turned it over to pasture and um, to sporting estates. So it's, it, it's, it is a post-colonial. I, I, I mean, I know some people don't like that post-colonial reading. I think it works. I think it is the colonization of a land for new, by, by new, for, for new ways of life. And many people have to move, have to leave that land at that point. I David. hope that kind of helps answer your question. David Purdy? So what's Scott's journal? Yes. It's apparently edited by Eric Anderson, former president of this club. It's replete with references to a man called Tom Purdy. Yes, his, yes. Um, Forrester, yes. his water bailiff, uh, and his librarian uh, at Abbotsford and intimately involved with the conservation of the, the landscape at, at Abbotsford. Yes. Uh, Tom failed to achieve a mention in your talk tonight. Why was that? Um, a time, I suppose, more than anything, and because I was really concerned with Scott and storytelling, although I think Tom Purdy probably did tell him, I know that he did tell him many stories. Um, just a matter of time, Tom Purdy is there in the larger um, compass of my work. I think he's very important to Scott. Um, I know he was very important to Scott. Um, not just as somebody who helped him around the estate, but as somebody with whom he could sort of chat about things. And um, that's, that would be my answer to that. Um, I'm working with um, Abbotsford Trust and with the estate, um, uh, people who, the, the estate workers at Abbotsford now, and talking with them about what they've been able to retrieve about Tom's work with Sir Walter. So I think there'll be interesting things that will come out, out of that. Magnificent man, responsible for lots of the planting of the trees and for guiding Scott in all sorts of ways. So no attempt to denigrate or to leave Tom Purdy out. Who, who has another question or observation? No? Well, I don't think I'm quite adequate to uh, thank you, Susan, but I think Madeline Mackenzie is. So, Madeline, may I ask you to say a word on our behalf, please? Yes. Well, Dr. Oliver, on behalf of the members of the club and the guests, thank you very much indeed for giving us such a, a wonderfully interesting and enjoyable talk. I hope there was something there. Oh, certainly. Um, it was fascinating to hear about Scott from an environmental and ecological perspective. Um, you've, I think you've whetted our appetite mm -hmm. and we'll all look forward to, to reading your forthcoming work on Green Scott. You've certainly given me a, a new and different way of, of looking at the novels and the poems. And I think we particularly hear, enjoyed hearing the, the part about Abbotsford that you mentioned from the journal um, and the, the part that the gardens and estate there played in, in Scott's life. And I'm sure we'll all be looking at the Abbotsford Gardens with deeper interest on our next visit. So our thanks again for, for coming here on this rather special day and our last vote on this election day is a vote of thanks to you. <laughs> so I ask everyone to join with me. Madeline. Now, uh, Susan, may I give you just a wee something oh. to remember us by? A, a little scarf with a picture of the Scott oh, Monument that is on it. Lovely. Thank uh, you. And a book uh, that uh, Peter Garside uh, pulled together uh, of extracts from some of the speeches of our past presidents. How and, lovely. Uh, may I join Madeline? Thank and you. thank you very much indeed for the work you've done and for bringing it to us tonight. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And, uh, uh, Indebted to Peter Garside for his work because he's been somebody who's been enormously helpful to me from the time that I first started working on Scotland. I think you're very fortunate to, to have him. Well, we're looking forward to having <laughs> yes, him as our next yes, chairman. Yes, thank you so much for these. This is a lovely gift. I should treasure those. Thank uh, you. There should be a glass of wine and uh, eventually some yeah. canapes outside, ladies and gentlemen.